When Syatet was born and growing up, few would have dreamt that this small boy from a poor rural village who had little education, knew little Pali, would become the first householder teacher in this tradition since the time of the Buddha. He became the critical link between the great monk Lady Sayadaw and Saiji Uba Kin and started this whole tradition of householder teachers. Let's first orient ourselves with a map. This is Yangon or Rangoon and a busy bustling city. It's now very much showing signs of the British presence. As you can see, grand British buildings like the Recorder's Court, a centre of British administration, a huge Victorian building, and somewhat dwarfing the pagoda in the background. And that was rather symbolic. And underneath the Rangoon River, busy with steamboats plying here and there, British built boats. But when you go from Yangon, busy bustling Yangon, and you go down south and you take a ferry across the Yangon River, you come to Dalla, a small market town, and from there you go seven miles south and you're in a totally different universe. This is the rice bowl of Burma, the delta of the Yangon River, very fertile, endless rice fields, thatched houses, water buffalo wallowing in muddy ponds. A very, very different environment. And this is the village of Port Bweji, Sayatet's home village where he was brought up. Now this is one of the streets in the village, unpaved as you see. Just imagine a small ten-year-old boy. I say small because he was very small for his age, very short, undersized. He's walking down that street carrying a tray of vegetable fritters on his head. He recently lost his father, he's only ten years old, and his mother is trying to support him and the family by selling vegetable fritters. So she sends him out to sell them. But he's so shy, he doesn't even call out what he's selling, and he doesn't sell any, or hardly any. So his mother says, all right, and sends his sister with him. And his sister calls out the wares, and then they do sell some. The family is landless, and so to feed themselves, they glean rice stalks from the fields after harvest. But the boy is kind. At one stage, he finds some fish dying in a dried up pond. He picks them up. His mother, who is very strict about Sheila, is about to beat him, thinking he's going to kill and eat them, when she realizes he's actually taking them to a bigger pond to save them. Because they're so poor, he has little education. After six years, he has to leave school. And at the age of 14, he goes out to work, he becomes a bullock cart driver, just like the bullock cart in the picture. He earns a quarter of a kyat a day, that's 25 pros. And he's so small that he has to take a wooden box to get up onto the bullock cart and get down off it again, because he's not tall enough to reach it. Of his quarter of a kyat a day, which he earns, he gives it all to his mother. Later on, he becomes a sampan rower, and there's a typical sampan there. All up and down the river, because this is such a fertile area, and prospering because the British had now opened the Suez Canal, and that opened the trade in Burmese rice right through to Europe. And there were rice mills all up and down the river, and he would be loading and unloading big sacks of rice at the mills onto his sampan. And you can see the size of those sacks. And the owner of rice mill number 25 sees this small boy working hard, loading these sacks of rice, takes pity on him, and says, all right, you can come and work in my rice mill as a tallyman. That's just counting the rice like a clerk, counting the bags which are 
load it on, load it off. And now he's earning six cats a week. He gives five cats to his mother and lives on his own in the rice mill on rice and split pea fritters. He makes an egg lasts for two meals when he gets one and a piece of salt lasts for a week. The Indian watchman and the coolies say, well, why don't you just take the sweepings off the floor? You can eat those. And he says, no, I won't take them. They don't belong to me, they belong to the mill owner. The mill owner hears about this and says, yes, of course you can take the rice sweepings. So he takes those. And then the bullock cart owner and the sampan owner also give him rice. So he still takes the sweepings and gives them to the poor. He's diligent, he's industrious, he's honest. His owner values his work. And now his salary rises to 15 kyats a month. And not only that, but the mill owner says you can have a free milling of a hundred baskets of rice every week. So now he can support himself quite well and he can support his mother quite well. At the age of 16, he gets married. It's an arranged marriage to a lady called Mia Min. She's the daughter of well-to-do landowners who do own property around the village and they're happy for him to marry their daughter because although he doesn't have any money, they can see he's honest, he's industrious, he'll be an asset to the family. They have two children, a son and a daughter, and they live in a joint family with Miao Min's parents and her two sisters. And he now starts trading in rice, he becomes a rice trader, an honest and respected merchant, and prospers. He now prospers to the extent that he's got time to actually practice some meditation. He starts practicing anapana with a local teacher pretty casually. He also has time to take robes as a samanera, a novice, which was the standard part of every Burmese boy's education, but which before that he'd never been able to do. So now we have Upo Tet. He's now Upo Tet, Mr. Tet, a prosperous, honest, respected rice merchant, living in the bosom of his extended family, content with his life, happy in the village. And then tragedy strikes. In 1903, an epidemic of cholera sweeps through Lower Burma. The sanitation, as you can imagine, was not good. The Burmese were very vulnerable to it. The epidemic reached poor Beji village. In two days, he lost five of his family members. He lost his son. He lost his daughter. His daughter, in the agonies of cholera, died in his arms, saying, Father, help me, please. And of course, he couldn't help. He was devastated. The whole family was in mourning. It is said the sound of sobbing and weeping was coming from the house. And the whole village was in fear. No one dared go outside for fear of catching this dread disease. He finds no refuge anywhere. So he begs his wife, please, may I go out and find refuge in Dhamma? In this world, there's a way of dying. There must be a way of undying. I want to find the immortal Dhamma. She's very reluctant. I need you. But he presses her, and finally, reluctantly, she gives her permission. So he takes off, leaves the village with his lifelong companion, U Nyo. You'll hear that name many times in this talk. And he leaves for 13 years. And he goes all over Burma with Unyo, teacher after teacher, forest after forest, retreat after retreat. It is said that he meditated with all the great monk teachers of his day. For the first year or two, he came back home at the end of the harvest usually, just to see how things were going, to see his family. But after those first year or two, he didn't anymore, he never came back. And he just worked continuously. 
And then he met this teacher, Lady Sayadaw. And Lady Sayadaw taught him Anapana and the rudiments of Vipassana. And Lady Sayadaw said, you should work more on your own, on a solitary basis. So Tet goes off, spends a lot of time, not just at Lady Sayadaw's monastery, where he took retreats, but in caves up and down the Chindwin River, just like Lady Sayadaw had done. And this went on for 13 years. And at the end of that time, he was very disappointed. He felt he'd attained very little. He was not satisfied with his meditation. And he decided to give up all this and go home. And Lady Sayadaw's parting words were these. Keep practicing, strengthen your samadhi. When your samadhi, your concentration becomes strong, panya will arise. And when Panya arises, you will be able to spread Dhamma. So he has a prediction early on from Lady Sayadaw that Sayatet will become a teacher. So he goes home. But when he reaches his village, he doesn't go back to his house. His family had built a sala or a hall at the edge of his property. He'd been involved in that many years earlier. And instead of going home, he goes straight to the hall with Unyo, his companion, and just starts meditating. Now it so happened that about a week before, the villagers, seeing this hall being neglected for so long, decided to give it a good clean-up. They had a working bee. And they fixed the place up, tidied it, and put out flowers, water. So when Tet came there, he found all that there, flowers, water, everything, all beautiful and nice for him. Starts meditating, and his eye falls on these three Buddha statues which were in the hall, one of which his own family had donated, the one on the left. And underneath the statue, there was a plaque commemorating the donors. His name, of course, was there, and so was the name of his dead daughter. He saw that, tears welled in his eyes, and then huge disappointment that after 13 years of intensive meditation, he could still be afflicted by these sharp pangs of grief. And then he remembered Lady Sayadaw's words. There is only one unique root of Satipatthana, which will clear away all the confusion, the defilements, the tears, the crying, the worry, and the suffering. And he redoubles his efforts. Now, he hasn't seen his wife, and she's very displeased. She doesn't go to see him either, and so he's got no one to feed him. So he and Unyo get a local lady, and they pay her, and every day she brings them their meals. And so he continues to meditate. At one time, he's sitting meditating, and a four-foot-long cinnabar red poisonous snake comes out of the woodwork, out of the floor, a hole in the floor, slithers along and settles in his lap. And he thinks. This thought comes in his mind. If this snake bites me, I will die but once. But inside my body, I have these four elements earth, air, fire and water, which I keep reacting to. And if they keep biting me, if I keep reacting, I will die many times and never escape samsara. So, do your job, he thinks. Let Dhamma take care. He sends metta to the snake. After a while, the snake slithers away. And so he continues to meditate. All the time, his samadhi is getting stronger and he's getting sensations all the way through his body, but somehow his concentration is too broad, he can't penetrate, so he feels stuck. And then one day he has this experience. He got up 4 a.m. as usual, his awareness was good, his concentration was good, he's observing the whole body, and suddenly at the top of his head he gets very strong, prominent sensations just a coin size area, one inch diameter as Goenkaji would say, at the top of the head. 
and he starts observing that and with his strong samadhi suddenly he can penetrate it. He can understand it's a nature. It's changing. He can understand the contact, the sensation, the whole process going on. And he gets the arising and passing, he understands that, and dissolution. So suddenly, the Dhamma that he'd been looking for, all over Burma, from teacher after teacher, he'd found in his own house, on his own property, in his own body. This coin size circle starts expanding, expanding, it covers the whole body, becoming bigger and bigger, full dissolution, and he understands everything. Now he realizes that he's reached an important stage in his meditation. This is a breakthrough. And he wants to consult Lady Sayadaw. Of course, Lady Sayadaw is up in Upper Burma, a long way away. But he remembers that at home, he's got Lady Sayadaw's books, so he wants to consult them. But of course he has to go home, and he does. All the time that he'd been away, his wife and her sister had looked after the rice fields, and they'd been supporting him. They'd been sending him a thousand cats a year, and often they went without in order to support him. Sometimes they were just eating leftover rice, things like that little bit of fish paste or whatever, just to support him. And now, because he hadn't gone to see them, they were very angry, especially his wife, and she decided to divorce him. And she and her sister had got together, and they'd made a plan to divide up the property, they'd give Tet his bit, and have nothing more to do with him, and they'd just look after their bit. And suddenly, they see him coming. He's coming with Unyo, his companion, and the sister says to the wife, Hey, Miamin, remember what you said, remember you're deciding to divorce him, don't even talk to him. And she shoots out of the house as fast as she can, determined to leave the property quickly before she meets him. And he approaches. And she finds the sister, she can't leave. So she just starts pacing agitatedly up and down outside the house. Tet comes nearer and nearer, and she melts. Later, Unio felt it was simply Tet's meta. And suddenly she says to him, How are you? How's your health? Why have you come? Leads him into the house, calls out to Miao Min, Hey, Miao Min, your husband's here, make some tea. And he's welcomed. So they have a very nice cup of tea together, and then Tet calmly goes upstairs, starts reading Lady Sayadaw's books. Nya Min and her sister start preparing lunch. They invite all the neighbours, have a big party, and it all goes very, very well. After the party's over, Tet says to his wife, I'm so grateful for all the support you've given me over all these years, and the only way I can repay it is to give you Dhamma. And please understand that now I'm on eight precepts, please regard me from now on as a brother. So he's celibate. And Nyamin accepts this. And she says, OK, that's fine. So you keep meditating in your hall, but every day come for lunch. And he does that. But after two weeks, he feels he's wasting time in that little journey every day to his house. And he points this out to her. So she says, all right we'll bring you a lunch in the hall. And they do that, and so he continues. Now the villagers had seen how he came home, seen how he didn't go to his wife or his family, and just meditated. And they thought, maybe he's gone mad, maybe he's deranged, maybe all those losses of his family, his daughter and so forth, were too much for him. So they were very suspicious. But after a while, seeing his actions, seeing the way he behaved himself, they realized, yes, he is. He's a changed person. He's a real Dhamma person leading a Dhamma life. And they're curious. And some of them start coming to him and saying, well, could you please teach us meditation too? So the first course is arranged, just 15 students in his little hall, just an Anapana course. Nyami and his wife and her sister do all the organizing, they feed the meditators, 
it's a good course, successful course, and then more courses are held, two or three more courses, same arrangement. On one occasion, his laborers come and take a course, and Miao Min and the sister even pay the laborers their wages to sit the course because they couldn't afford the course any other way. So his laborers sit like that. But they say, please don't tell anybody else. <laughs> so in October of that year, he's now been home about a year, 14 years he's been meditating. He decides he'll go back to Lady Sayadaw. He takes his wife and his sister to report his attainments. He comes to Lady Sayadaw. He offers him the usual requisites, monk's requisites, robes, sandals, umbrella, and so forth. And Lady Sayadaw says to him, are you really grateful? And he says, yes, sir, very grateful. And Lady Sayadaw says, yes, well, you brought all these requisites, but if really you're grateful, you must do exactly what I say. And he says, yes, sir, I will try. So Lady Sayadaw says to one of his attendants, bring me my staff. So the attendant brings the staff. Everyone wonders what he's going to say next. He gives the staff to Sayatet and authorizes him as a teacher with these words. Take my staff. And he says, the staff is not for long life. It's for success as a teacher. From now on, you must teach this Dhamma to 6,000 people, no less, and propagate the Dhamma, pay homage in my stead. Next day, as you know, Lady Sayadaw calls the monks together. He says to Tet, can you stay a few days? Tet says, yes, I can. And so Lady Sayadaw says to his monks, this is my great pupil, Tet, from Lower Myanmar, you can teach meditation like me. You take a course with him, practice with him. He can teach like me, learn the technique. And he says to Tet, hoist the victory banner of Dhamma in my stead. So not only has Lady Sidor made this extraordinary, remarkable move of appointing the first householder teacher in a country totally dominated by monks, but he's also asked this teacher to give a course to his own monks. And that course was held, 25 monks, learned monks, who knew far more about the theoretical aspect of Dhamma than Tet did, but they were practicing meditation, of course, and it was 10 or 15 days. And then Tet goes home. But before he goes home, he says this to Lady Sayadaw. He points out, among all your students, I am the least learned in the scriptures. You've given me a subtle, heavy task. Please give me priority. If ever I have questions, if ever I need clarification or guidance, please help me. And if I do anything wrong, please admonish me. And Lady Sayadaw reassures him. He says, I will not forsake you until I reach Nibbana. So with these words ringing in his ears, Sayatet goes home with his family. Now, 6,000 students is a lot of students. And Sayatet is thinking, now, how can I do this? I will have to go around the country and give courses that way. It's the only way I can do it. But his wife and his sister object. They say, look, you've been away so long already. You've only been back a year, and now you're going away again. If you go, we'll be very angry. And not only will we be angry, the whole village will be angry if you go away again now. Why not stay here? You can use your Dhamma hall. You can teach in that. I've spoken to the carpenter. We can expand it. We can extend it. And if you teach here, many people will come to you. He thinks over it and says, yes, all right, you're right. I was thinking I'd have to travel, but maybe I don't. Let's do it here. And so he starts teaching right here. And this is his Dhamma hall, his expanded Dhamma hall. And it seems that this is the first time that there was actually a meditation center devoted purely to meditation. Of course, there were the monasteries and the monks meditated in them, but many other activities, periyati, other things, also went on at the monasteries. But here, it was pure patipati, pure meditation. And he didn't have fixed-length courses. 
That came later with Ubar Kin and Goenkaji. But he would encourage people to stay at least a week, and he would always give at least three days Anapana, the precepts to start with, and so he taught like that. Now this is the inside of his hall as expanded. You can see the original little room with the three Buddha statues in it, and there are a couple of people meditating in it in the photo. And all that wooden area beyond, the wooden floor, is the extended area. And so quite a number of people could fit there. And Sayatet used to sit on a low choki, facing the students. Uh, he'd give instructions, he'd check them. He had a low choki. If any monk came, he would give the monk a far higher seat than him and always be very careful to pay respects to the monk, deep respects to the monk. And in the evening, he'd give a discourse. And remember that he knew very little Pali and had hardly read the scriptures. But he knew Lady Sayadaw's writings almost by heart. It was said he could even quote page numbers. And on the basis of that, the discourses that he gave, which were attended not just by his students, but other people from outside came in to listen, no one would believe that he had very little theoretical knowledge of Dhamma. And none of the learned monks could find any criticism of his discourses at all. He was on eight precepts. At lunchtime, he'd always eat on his own. And so the courses continued day by day. After he'd given instructions and checked in the mornings, he'd retire to this little cell, which is out to the left at the side of the Dhamma Hall. And you can see it's a little cell with a wooden entrance. And from there, he'd just give metta. In 2000, Goenkaji came, visited the place, and left this plaque. May the sacred vibrations grow and keep on helping meditators. His reputation started spreading. Not only the local farmers, the local villagers were coming, but people now were coming from Rangoon, from Yangon. Ubar Kin was one of them, of course, but government officers, even ministers, many people would be coming. And you'll see the notice below. That was the notice at the front of his center. He never discussed his meditation attainments with anyone. But it was widely believed that he was anagami. That's the last stage before Arant. And so he was known as Anagan Sayatet. And you can see it there. Now the hall was becoming quite crowded. You'd get 100, 200 people in there. He's becoming very popular. So he has to ask his old students, please go home and meditate at home just come for the discourse in the evening because there's no room anymore. So it continued, and he became more and more popular. But being a householder teacher, he had to face difficulties which no monk would ever have had to face. A few stories. At one time, a group of meditators came from Rangoon, and they were the students of a learned monk there. They came to Sayatet to take a practical course and to meditate. When the monk heard of this, he wasn't very pleased. So a couple of days later, he rocks up and he goes straight to Sai Tet's house, knocks on the door, demands to speak to Sai Tet. So Tet comes down and the monk says, where are my students? And Tet says, well, they're in the hall meditating. And the monk says, what do you mean by teaching meditation? You're a householder. Householders shouldn't be teaching meditation. You must stop immediately. Now, this is from a senior monk. And Sayatet handled it beautifully. He said, well, yes, sir, maybe I should stop. But what if I'm correct? What if what I'm teaching is good? Why don't you come and try for a few days yourself? And you can judge for yourself whether the technique is good or not. And the monk says, I'm very busy. I can't do that. And Tet says, well, over these next 10 days, I might fall sick. I might die and you will never know whether what I was teaching was correct or not. So the monk's trapped. He sits, he sits the 10 days. At the end, he humbly apologizes to Sayatet. On another occasion, an old man in the village was very offended that Sayatet was teaching and he actually tried to persuade a friend of his, oh, don't go there, this man, he doesn't know anything, he doesn't even know Pali, what are you doing going to him? 
And Syed always had this difficulty because he was a householder. Uh, these problems came. The friend did go, got great benefit. But the old man wasn't mollified. One time, Syed was walking down the street in front of the old man's house. The old man comes out and starts abusing him. Syed says, well, look, did you want to talk to me? I have to go somewhere now, but I'll come back in a little while and I'll come and talk to you. And the old man says, no, I don't want you in my house. You're rubbish. And he continues to abuse him. Now, walking behind Syed was one of his students. And the student heard all this abuse. And he turned round to the old man and said, he thought it was for him. He said, are you insulting me? And the old man said, no, I'm talking to Sai Tet. And the student said, why are you talking to Sai Tet like that? You're accusing him of things which are completely wrong. You've got no reason to do that at all. And so a big argument starts and they come to blows. During all this, Sai Tet shows no disturbance, no change in his facial expression. He just keeps walking. Later on, he explains to the student, if I'd got into any kind of argument with this old man, he'd have just created more akusala kama, unwholesome actions, unwholesome thoughts. So that's why I didn't. That evening, during the discourse, Sayatet talked about kanti, about tolerance, with that quote below, saying, even someone who curses you or hits you, they're helping you because they're developing your tolerance. There's one more story. Syatet was giving a discourse once, and some creditors came to him. These were old business associates, they used to be rice traders. And during that time, they used to lend each other money from time to time, and he'd borrowed 4,000 cats from them. And he thought it was repaid long ago, but apparently it hadn't been. So they arrived during the discourse and said, hey, you owe us money. And the demeanor wasn't pleasant. And they'd done a calculation. They'd included some interest, and they'd said, well, now it's not 4,000 cats, it's 90,000 cats. It was an outrageous amount of money. And Tet said to his family, please just, just pay them. I don't want any slur on Dhamma, I don't want any arguments disturbing things. So the family had to sell some jewelry, had to sell part of their land to pay these outrageous creditors but he never wanted any confrontation. Later on, when he was elderly, another incident. By now, he was not looking after, of course, his own farm. His family were doing that for him. That, they'd been doing that for a long time. And the deal was that at harvest time, laborers would come in, they'd harvest the rice, and as their pay, they would get a proportion of the harvest. And these laborers came along and said, hey, you haven't paid us our proper share, you've, you've stolen from us. Again, it was an outrageous accusation. Sai Tet knew nothing about it at all, his family were managing it. And Uba Kin and another student said, look, don't you worry about it, you just carry on teaching, we'll defend you in court, they've not got a case, it'll just fall just like that. And Sai Tet said, no, I don't want the name of Vipassana being dragged through the courts, just pay them whatever they want. And so his family had to sell some more of their property. And after that, they could no longer afford to support the meditators and provide the food for the courses. That had to be done by someone else. But he never wanted any confrontation. A more serious problem arose when a local Sayadaw again took great offence that here was Sai Tet, a householder teaching meditation, and he started creating all kinds of disturbances for Sai Tet students. Fireworks were suddenly being let off outside the meditation hall. Children were playing out there, all kinds of stuff. And Sai Tet didn't want to have any argument, he just moved. He said, Dhamma can be taught anywhere, I'll just move somewhere else, and left. Luckily, Another Sayadaw at the other end of the village, Anok Sayadaw, said, come to my monastery, you can use that, and continue there. So Anok Monastery became 
Syatet's second meditation centre, and actually he far preferred it. It was further away from the village. As you can see, it's in the middle of a field, a rural area, very quiet, very peaceful. And I love the notice underneath, the English, Insight Meditation Subject Teachable Monastery. So there he was teaching meditation. Now, what did he teach? As I said, he wrote nothing. So we don't know directly what he taught. But he did appoint assistant teachers. One of his assistant teachers was Unyo, his old companion. Another one was Usan Tain. And Usan Tain, both of them actually, set up meditation centers of their own. And sometime later, an Australian student, Marie Biles, came from Australia to take a course with Usan Tain. And she wrote a book about her experiences. It's called Journey into Burmese Silence. You can still get it. And this Marie Biles herself was a remarkable woman. She was an explorer. She was a mountaineer. She led expeditions to scale mountains in different continents. She was an early conservationist, one of the national parks in Sydney called Budai National Park, was founded by her. She was a journalist, and she was the first practicing female solicitor in New South Wales. So a woman of many talents, very gifted. So she takes her course, and she starts, she describes how she starts with the precepts, eight precepts, and then Anapana. And here's her description of Anapana. You'll find it very familiar. I was to gain concentration by watching the mind and the feeling of the breath coming in, coming in, going out. And obviously she got good concentration because within a few days it went down to a pinpoint and she could feel this creation destruction ceaselessly coming into existence, passing out of existence, what Goenkaji would call a nature or rising and passing away. So she's getting good concentration. And then she describes Vipassana. We extend this conception of ceaseless creation and destruction. The Burmese called it fit piet, fit piet, arising and passing, anicca, from the top of the head, as always, and thence through the whole body, until we become conscious of the whole body and mind as nothing but particles. And then we bring this understanding to everything connected with mind and body, the six sense doors and their objects. So a very familiar technique. This Marie Biles lived in Sydney, lived in Western Sydney. You can still see her house. That's a photograph of her above. And next to her house, she built a little retreat centre. And that's a photograph of that. It's open to the public. You can visit it today, if ever you're in Sydney. And you'll be welcome. And now we come to Syatet's final years. He's now in his 70s. His wife has passed away. His sister-in-law is paralysed. His own health is failing. But he's taught his 6,000 plus students. He's done the duties which Lady Sayadaw asked him to do. He taught anyone and everyone who came to him for 30 years. And now he divides his property among his nieces and nephews. He's got no immediate family left. He just keeps 50 acres aside for the maintenance of his dhamma hall. And he also has 20 water buffalo. These are the ones who tilled his fields. And he makes sure he gives them away to a good home where they won't be worked and they can retire in peace. And these are his parting words to his water buffaloes. You've been my benefactors. Thanks to you, the rice has grown. Now you're free from your work Next time, may you get a better existence. May you be released from this kind of life. And it's said that when they heard these words, the water buffaloes bowed their heads and tears came in their eyes. It's now 1945, and he goes for the last time to Rangoon. He goes and stays with his old companion, Unyo. Unyo now has a meditation center on the northern slopes of the Shwedagon. And he spends time with his students, Uba Kin and others, and also a lot of time meditating in a dugout air raid shelter 
constructed during the war. Now, unfortunately, this shelter was cold and damp, and he caught a chill. So he was sick, he got medical treatment, but in spite of the treatment, he started getting worse and worse. They realize it's his final days. His family comes from the village, and every night, his students, about 50 of them, will come to meditate with him. He says nothing, he just meditates. And then one night, he, his breath starts becoming longer and longer, at almost exactly 11 o'clock, three long, deep breaths, about five minutes each, and on the third breath, he passes away. Before he passed away, he said, I will be cremated in a place where no one has been cremated before, but you should not keep my ashes, because I am not a fully liberated person, therefore don't keep them. So he was cremated on the northern slopes of the Shwedagon, near Unyo Center. Ubarkin and his students built a little pagoda there, but unfortunately today it's gone. We can't see it anymore. Very difficult to gain access to that area now. So this is Sayatet. He was the key link between the great Lady Sayadaw and Ubarkin. He was the first householder teacher, and because of his success as a teacher, the whole tradition was able to start, Vipassana was able to spread widely thereafter, and we could get it today. So we're very grateful to this wonderful teacher, Sayatet. <laughs>